touchdown. And as I'm running, like he catches up to me low key. And there's like a big tree right on the left. So he pushes me to the tree. I'm like, yo, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, like, bro, you've been doing this like the whole time since we started back school. Like, why go on? He's just like, oh, you think you're so much better than us? You think you're so much faster? You think you're so, huh, huh, huh? He pushes me on my chest. I'm like, yo, Sean, I really don't want to do this. And then uh, he comes in. He's like, oh, you want to go, buddy? You want to go? You want to go? I'm like, yeah, bro, let's grab. Let's grab. I'm like, all right. So I push him. He kind of hits like the tree. He comes for a swing. I like, I was like, Ali, bro. I kind of like, you know, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee type of thing. You know what I'm saying? So I back up. And then I just like, I didn't even know I had this like strength within me. I just like went for a punch. Boom. Yeah, man. I remember I was in grade 12 and I asked out this one girl for prom. Her name was, uh, I don't want to say her name, but. We ain't airing it. We ain't, this is the part in, in, in it. Oh, okay. Her name was right? Okay. She was Italian and. St. Chris in, in Sarnia was like a very, very Italian pot, like very Italian driven school. So mm -hmm. I put on a spectacle in the lunchroom. Uh, everybody was doing these prom proposals. So I'm like, yo, I got to come correct. I'm just oh. not going to ask a chick like, yo, raw, like yo, come to prom. And, uh, so I had this box where I keep all my jewelry in and it, it's like very springy. So it's like, when you open it, it's like, ch -ch -ch. it's like one of those cases you keep like your chains and whatever. And uh, I wrote, like, will you go to prom with me? Kind of like I'm proposing to her, right? So mm -hmm. come to lunch. All the men know I'm, like, about to ask Valerie to prom. And then uh, I go over to her. <clears throat> and I sit down beside her. I, like, you know, chop some stuff. I'm like, yeah, you know, Valerie, like, you know, whatever, whatever. Like, you're really cool. And then uh, as I'm getting down on one knee, all the, bro all the bros are just like, yo, oh. Let's go. And everyone's looking at my end. So as I get on one knee, right? I ask Valerie, like she reads the nose, like, will you go to prom with me? And uh as she's talking, she's talking to me, but no one can hear what she's saying. She's telling me, Hey, oh, like, you know, I really like you as a friend, but like I I'm gonna I'm gonna be going to the prom with my girls. So she rejects me right then and there. So me with my pride. I don't really react to it. I'm, I stand up like still looking happy, like as if she said yes. So as I'm walking back, all the, everyone's just like clapping, like, let's go. Like everyone like thinks she said yes, but I go down to the, the, the like the lunch table, like where I'm sitting at and I'm telling the guys, I'm like, guys, like she said, no. So where it gets around that she said no. So the whole spectacle goes down, but you know, one of my best friends, Mike Rocca, he tells me, Hey bro, like, I just want you to know, and I always keep it real with you, man. I've never lied to you. This is Mike. The reason she said no, bro, is because you're black. Straight up. Wow. Mike tells me that. I'm like, man, like, what the hell? What do you mean? He's like, bro, listen. If you show up with her to pick her up for prom, and her Italian grandma is there, and she sees you, these Italian grandmas are mad racist, bro. So Valerie, she might rate you like that. She likes you. She's like friends with you, but her family might not rate you the way she's rating you. So she's saving you from like a lot of like, you know, stuff that can happen that you don't even know about. So don't even take it like personal like that, man. It's just like these old school grandmas and Italians, man, they see black people as like lazy, like, you know, there's a stigma they have of us. It's like we're lazy. We're we don't like we don't have a work ethic. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. S stuff like that. So Mike just kept it real with me. I told my mom that story, and she's just like, "Yo, honestly, when I'm not surprised, man. So don't even sweat it." Damn, bro. How did he know that shit though? He was best friends with her or something? He's Italian, and he's seen it. Oh, Mike's Italian. Yeah, yeah. Mike Rocca. Okay. Damn. How'd that make you feel, bro? Now, damn, now after that, I'm like, damn, this is actually a much better story than I thought. Shit. <laughs> maybe we should have. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can keep this, man. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's wild card, right? It, it is what yeah. it is. Um, but All right, I'll block her name out. Then I'll block her name out. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's All stories. Right. It's, it's things like this that shape up your, your character. I mean, from that growing up in Sarnia, man, I never really had like a, a bad 
racial experience, man. I mean, I had the only racial experience I ever had was actually here in Toronto, man. I was actually working for Good Life Fitness, and then uh, I was going for a Timmy's run. So I was working as a fitness advisor. My manager and I, we go to Timmy's. This is on King and Bathurst, so we're standing at uh, Timmy's. And, uh, you know, we get there. I get my regular order, honey cruller, uh, you know, dark roast, um, half a cream, half a sugar. And as I'm leaving, uh, someone behind me says, go back to your country. Right? And I'm wow. like, I look at Edric. I'm like, Ed, did you hear that? And it's like, oh, Cindy, what are you talking about? So I'm like, dog, like someone just told me to go back to my country, like behind me. Like I just felt this energy behind me. So we both turn around. We see this guy standing behind us. So this guy's waiting for the TTC. He's waiting for the streetcar to go back east on, 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 uh, on Queen, on Queen and Bathurst. So I'm like, yo, I turn around. It's like this like fat guy. He's like white. And then he turns like, yeah, you, he looks at me. He's just like, go back to your fucking country, you nigga. Like, N-word, bro. In my face. In my face, my guy. And I'm just, like, looking at this guy. I look at Edric. Edric's like, yo, 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 send it, send it. Don't even do anything, bro. Don't even do anything, man. Because I'm here holding, like, Timmy's, donuts, whatever. I'm holding my hot coffee. I'm ready to go back to the club. You know, and we're both wearing Good Life shirts. So, like, whatever we do... <laughs> anything it's going to reflect back on on the corporate brand right if i if i throw hands good life is is in the midst of things edric my manager he's another black guy too so he's like an older he's like big bro to me he's like bro don't even worry about it don't even sweat it like yo this guy is this guy's a waste man don't even try and do anything with it so i sucked out my pride i looked at him and i kind of laughed bro you know what i'm saying i kind of laughed it off i was like man you're 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 in such a low position in your life right now that that's the first thing you're thinking about saying that to me. You know, I just kind of like took like the, the higher ra- the higher road and I just looked at it. I was like, you know what? It is what it is. And I moved on and I changed my attitude around it. And I was just like, I think you're just going through some stuff and you wanted to like pick a fight. And yeah, dude, like that's what happened. Wow. What a, what an asshole, man. What a dumb, dumb. What the hell? Bro, I can't even. You know, first, I'm sorry you have to go through that, bro. Ah, damn, some fat, you know, loathing white man had to say some dumb. You know, like I hear people have to try to offload their energy onto you. Like that's some of the dumbest things, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it is what it is, man. Like growing up, being black, my mom used to tell me like when I was a kid, I was just like, Yo, Owen, you have to remember, you're a black guy. You're you're gonna be a black man. I was like, Mom, why you didn't tell me like. You're black, you're black, you're black. I never got it, right? I was like, yo, everyone likes me, mom. I have so many friends. All my teachers are nice to me. Like, as a young kid, it's so hard to experience racism. But she was mentally preparing me to know that wherever you go, you have to remember who you are. You're going to you have to work 10 times as harder to get the things you want. You're not, some things were not going to go to you because you're not going to be able to comprehend why they happen. But you have to know deep down there's hidden forces which you cannot see but you have to be able to interpret them as you get older to see why those are not happening so she prepped me heavy early on to have a certain mentality and she told me that a lot of things are not going to be given to you because of certain things a lot of the things you want will not be able to you'll not be able to have access to them because of your your background and everything but you will still be able to attain them but you might have to go a different route just to be able to get the things that you want. So be ready for that. I used to like blow her off and my like, oh, whatever. You're just talking just to talk, right? But as I get older now, man, I'm 27. I'm like the prime of my life. I'm seeing everything she told me back in 2000, 2003 playing right in front of my eyes, man. Facts. What was your very first racial experience? Very first? Yeah. Hmm. I think when I moved to Canada, I realized that life was going to be different in Canada than it was in Nairobi. And I say that to say back in Nairobi, I didn't even know what being black is. I had no clue, no clue. 
because everyone's black. Like this is like the race. This is you know this is what life is. Imagine growing up from one years old to seven, your reality and your your childhood is shaped by those formative years. So when I kick, I when I and you would see like white people or whatever. I'm like whatever. It is what it is. Those are like foreigners. But life as I knew it, it's us as Africans. If we go to Tanzania, we go to Uganda, we go to South Africa, we go to Somali, everyone looks like this. So you're kind of like in this bubble. So when I come to Canada, that's when I was labeled, oh, you are a African-American. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm Kenyan. Like, what are you talking about? You know? So when I came here, all the kids would make fun of my accent. Uh, they will make fun of the way I spoke. Uh, when I used to bring food from home, like the lunches, they'll be e eating uh, these like lunchable, you know, like those crackers with cheese in it. Oh. Right, and and, and uh, these cheesy stuff like you 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 rip up the the plastic and there's a cheese dip in it with some salami, and yeah. my mom is like making me hot food, bro. <laughs> you get me? She has a flask with rice and beans and like peas and cabbage. It's like home cooked meal, so it's like warm when I open it. So one time, like when you open these things, a whole aroma fills up the whole classroom, yeah. fills it up the whole joint. And I remember one kid just looked like, so like when I opened it, everything is stuffed in there. It doesn't look presentable as you look at it in the plate. Mm -hmm. One kid comes like, ew, like, what is he eating? Oh my God. Like, what are you eating? Like, is like, is that like what you eat in your country? Like, guys, look at this. And I was just like, on my chair, dog, I'm like sweating. I'm like attracting a track. I'm attracting so much attention. And everyone's just like, Oh, man, like, what are you eating? And, you know, so stuff like that, like those micro first grade three, I'm experiencing what it's like to be different. Um, the way I speak was always just like whenever I say something, he's like, I was like, I was like, I was like, in my head, I'm like, oh, like, hey, where's the, where's the bathroom? One kid like, where is the bathroom? like that they'll mock me in my oh, wow. face i was like i'd go home and i'd tell my mom I was like damn mom like today was rough kids are just laughing at the way i speak and uh yeah dude so that's what going man how about you <sighs> my first facial experience firstly bro that was that was insane i actually had something similar happened to me at lunch you know your mom was packing you hot food the food for sure you know, you know, like, you know, uh, black moms, bro. They don't let us go to school like eating word, fugazi. Word. Yeah, I started complaining though, and then I got diagnosed with lactose. So, so she started giving me like a whole bunch of white food. I ended up getting pea butter. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> can't have peanut butter. But bro, peanut pea butter is the like the most trash spread on the planet. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But uh, you need yeah, to mix it up like, with like a jam or something for it to taste yeah. good. Even with mixing up with the jam, it's still trash if you like peanut butter. Word, you know, eh? I'm a peanut butter lover. Yeah, pea butter is just, it ain't it. Mm -hmm. But um, my first racial experience was at Whitfield Academy. You know what I'm Whitfield saying? Academy. Yeah, yeah. It's funny enough. It's called Whitfield Academy. Um, my kindergarten class. Um, a teacher, I, I was there for like half a year, and a teacher had made like racist remarks to me apparently and to my mom about me so i ended up leaving the school i don't remember this because like i was like a parent teacher interview or something like that she thought i was like a fee for something like that or i was like exempl exemplifying uh racial like i don't know i don't, I, can't, I can barely remember it, but my mom would tell me about it because it was it was crazy that like at whitfield academy like i was getting treated racist and my last name is whitfield so i told her um, i own this joint a lie a lie she thought, <laughs> yeah bro and i think that she said that like i wouldn't amount to anything as a kindergarten like a, how kindergarten, do you even know that you know what i'm saying yeah bro it was nuts it was nuts um that was a, a distinct memory um one i think the most one the biggest one that i remember is the fact that i didn't know it was racist but i knew it was bad <laughs> you know what i'm saying so i think i was 11 or 12 and i had um, never been called nigga before, and I went to cadet camp. I was in cadets, mm -hmm. and um, someone had given me a condom, um, 
and I, I'm 11, 12. I don't even know what condoms are at this point, you know? Yeah. So I'm, like, I'm still so young and, like, unaware of life. I think that's, like, what, like, grade 5, 4? 12, yeah. You know? Grade 12 is, uh, I mean, age 12, you are 9, grade 11, eight, 12. Yeah, so you're grade 5, grade 6. Grade, grade 5, grade 6. So, yeah, you're still very, very green to stuff. Um, so this guy gave me an extra large condom in grade 5, 6. Firstly, I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> you know, um, yeah, actually said after, Excel like, on it. Yeah, yeah, it was, and I, I brought. I kept it to like grade nine, ten, and this this is a whole other story. But <laughs> little souvenir for you, man. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, as I was walking away, he said something racist, and I don't know if it was the N word. I don't know what it was, but everyone else reacted to it. I think I had blocked out of my memory, bro. Because it was it was like some crazy, mm-hmm. and have that. But I knew that he said something crazy because like my uncles would teach me to like handle somebody if they talk crazy to you, mm-hmm. you know. So everyone else had to be like, oh, he said da 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 da, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, I walked up, and this is thing my uncle used to do to me to like to like, you know, like make me like cower. Like he used to like take my hand and like would like. Play the knuckles together. Yo, man, yeah. my uncles did that the same same thing. Yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? And you know, they take it and you just feel like your wrist will like pop off or something like that. It's like they yeah. grab it so hard, it's like you are paralyzed right then and there. It's like you're at their mercy. It's like you try and move exactly. they press harder. So you just like stand still there and you're like, dog, like don't even try anything that's gonna mess yeah, me yeah. up. Word, word, word. So that that was the only defensive move I knew at the time. So so I walk up to him, I'm like, it's okay, bro, it's okay. And, like, like, I grab his hand, and I do that exact same thing. I rub his knuckles together, and he's like, ah, ah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's like, and I even know what he said, but I was like, don't you ever say no shit like that ever again in your life. <laughs> and he's like, okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uncle, uncle. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I just let him, I just let him go. Man. That was, like, my first time, you know? From that moment on, they never say nothing else. He just saw you, you know, nod his head, keep it moving. Exactly, they kept it moving. Yeah, you gotta teach these guys a lesson from time, bro. Like, you know, uh, even for that to happen, sometimes as a young guy, people will try and test you. And, you know, mm-hmm. people will see, I'm not a very combative guy, but like when I was tested, I defended myself. And I think that was in grade eight. People, this story was like one of legends. Like, I was like, recess you know we're playing football and grade eight i got super fast there's like this one kid sean he was like the golden child of school like he was like the athlete of the year and used to try and like neg me for whatever trying to just like push me to try and react because you notice i was like becoming more of an athlete than him i was faster i was stronger and i was just coming into my own so this summer coming into grade eight i just like was training hard at the ymca like for basketball season because i'm travel and we're playing recess, you know, I get the ball, man. Like my, I was like Ezekiel Elliott out there, man. I was just like, my cuts, my jukes, everything was just on point. So every ball I got, I was just like blasting. I was getting touchdowns. And um, throughout like that first couple months of school, like September, October, I noticed, you know, he used to like just talk shit. And whenever he like do dirty plays against me when, you know, we're playing, so I'm like, man, like, what the hell is this guy doing? So I kind of let it go. One day, we're about to go back in class after lunch recess. So it was like one of those like things, like, yo, last play wins, last play wins. So I get the ball, I get the pass, I catch it. I'm going towards the touchdown. And as I'm running, like, he catches up to me low key. And there's like a big tree right on the left. So he pushes me to the tree. I'm like, yo, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, like, bro, you've been doing this, like, the whole time since we started back school. Like, why go on? He's just like, oh, you think you're so much better than us? You think you're so much faster? You think you're so, huh, huh, huh? He pushes me on my chest. I'm like, yo, Sean, I really don't want to do this. And then uh, he comes in. He's like, oh, you want to go, buddy? You want to go? You want to go? I'm like, yeah, bro, let's grab. Let's grab. I'm like, all right. So I push him. He kind of hits, like, the tree. He comes for a swing. I, like, I was like, Ali, bro. I kind of, like... You know, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee type of thing. You know what I'm saying? So I back up, and then I just, like, I didn't even know I had this, like, strength within me. I just, like, went for a punch. Boom. Clean, right? Hit him. And the guy, like, he hit Bro, it was, like, connection. I just, I, I, honestly, I've never 
boxed. I've never thrown a punch. I've never done whatever. But he came after me. I kind of like dodged him, and I was going for my strike, and I hit him like right square on the jaw. Bam! Wow. The whole squad. This is grade eight, right? Everyone's just like, "Oh my god, yo, Owen! Oh my god, no, bro! What you? Ha- what happened? What happened?" Sean goes running in, inside, and like whatever. And he's there's a trail of blood. I'm like, "Oh my god! Like this is the oh. worst thing ever, man! This is, I did not want this at all." Um. It was so bad. I got suspended for like two weeks from school. Um, but I just kind of claimed self-defense. You know, I was like, man, like I, everybody saw what happened. So from that day, though, like that story, we have a small, this is a small town. I think what that story did for me is it let me know, like, it kind of got around that, yo, if you were to fight this guy, this could happen to you. And mind you, I'm not a fighter. Right. Mm-hmm. But I think it cemented me in a place where if you were to try me, this could happen. But I was never even going to try anything with anyone. That's the thing. But it was kind of a blessing in disguise that it happened because, you know, I, and now I had a reputation that. that I can fight. But yeah. I'm not a fighter, though. But I had that reputation. If people who know me, they know I hate fighting. I'm not a like I don't like fighting like that. I'm a peaceful guy. So I think for you, man, when you hit the guy with the wrists, he kind of just like, oh, my God. And you and everyone saw that. Now they knew not to me- mess with Alex Witt. Mess with you again. Exactly. You know, <laughs> you know what's going gonna... to you, bro. Yeah. You have to let it be known. Hey, I'm not the one to mess with. You got to do it. What you got to do is let them know, hey, I'm not the one. Sometimes you got to send a message. One. You got to send a message, you know, and you, you find it to do it in subtle ways. And people just know they, they will never try anything, but they know even if they try and come like wrong at you, they'll know that you can move like this. Exactly. Exactly, bro. Man, you know, speaking of move, you know what I'm saying? Yo, OnlyFans <laughs> is moving away from all the the pornography on, on the on their website, mm-hmm. on their platform, you know? Bro, what are your thoughts on this, man? Because this is, people are, are looking at it as like a betrayal, mm-hmm. you know? I mean... I remember watching Kevin Samuels like talk about this on Fresh and Fit actually, and he was talking to these girls who were saying, "Hey, we're making so much money on OnlyFans. We're making so much money on OnlyFans." And he was saying, "Yo, look, you guys are living in this bubble right now where you're making money on this platform, but you don't really have anything else going on outside of OnlyFans." And he actually predicted this. He said, "You know, OnlyFans." There's going to come a time where they built their platform up and they build their brand and they're going to take out adult content out of it. And it was just challenging them, like, okay, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? But that was just like a story to like, you know, tee up with what I'm saying. A lot of companies do this. A lot of companies do this all the time. They will use a strategy where they'll use adult content. They use a lot of um, nudity to really build up an audience, build interest. And then once they reach critical mass, they'll ban it, thinking that that's going to stay as it is. Those users will come and stay. Perfect example, Tumblr. Tumblr, back in 2007, 8, 9, was hot. was one of the hottest social networks you can even go on. You go on it, you see a lot of like sexual content, nudity, porn. Everything was on it. It was like more classified as like tasteful porn because it's not what you'd see on these other sites. It'll be more... The romantics exactly right it'll be more with taste to it like you see like a little nip slip a little boob or whatever you see a, a girl's ass it was what a, it, it was good so they sell to um yahoo uh well verizon verizon owns yahoo verizon decides to take pornography away from tumblr right they're like we're gonna clean it up we're gonna make it nice and ju- like good for the kids because this is a blogging platform and they're trying to introduce a blogging to a smaller generation <clears throat> man tumblr immediately becomes so soft it lacks the the it, bec- it becomes so lackluster subpar nothing on it everybody leaves tumblr i even forgot about tumblr I ha- I used I used to love Tumblr, bro. I used to go reblog swaggy fits, everything. Like I used to get inspiration yeah. from you know, like there was like a lot. I, I built such a mood board, and 
a lot of it had some some nudity on it. It was not like porn, but you'd be like there'll be like girls, you know, butt just chilling when she's in, in bed. Yeah. You know, but but now, bro, they sold to another company for three million when they sold to to Yahoo for a billion. So that that that's the danger of like doing taking out what what OnlyFans is doing is they'll they're in danger of becoming another Tumblr mm -hmm. and losing their value because this is what brought you guys so much attention and fame, and now you're taking it away and you're taking away people's ability to make money. Yeah, I, and. The pathway out of this is going to be a challenge because it's the brand they've created. It's not like they created more of a Patreon at, to balance mm -hmm. with the OnlyFans. It's been, oh, sorry, well, with the hub content, it's mm -hmm. been way more hub content than Patreon content. You know, so mm -hmm. their goal now, which is pretty obvious, is, hey, we want to be a, a Patreon competitor. But Patreon already has the brand for that. If I'm a... A, a podcast or a content creator youtuber i'm way more likely to go and create a patreon than an only fans account mm -hmm. that's just what it is you know and it's because the brand is is more suitable suited for that so they're gonna have a real struggle and a real a rebrand struggle you know so, so shout out to whichever pr team tries to do that because it's going they're going to have an uphill battle you know what i'm saying so this 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 decision is I just don't even know why they're making this decision when they're exact their brand equity it's the brand equity is worth billions. They want to they I think they want to get out pro probably. That's my assumption, you know. When you're trying to make those kind of decisions, you want to sell the company. Um apparently there's like this whole like conspiracy theory that um there's a company, not a company, a group of people, like a Christian group of people who are putting pressure on their payment providers to um, not mess with them. So mm -hmm. with that, um, they're like, oh, well, now we got to concede to getting rid of, um, you know, hub content. So they don't, you know, um, they can mess with those payment providers. That's the conspiracy theory that's been going around. But, you know, the hub has a payment provider. So whichever the, um, the hub is using, they can just go to that same person there's a lot of payment providers out there there's still a lot of hub content across the internet that's popping so if they get money mm -hmm. there's definitely got to be a way of to for them to get money point blank mm -hmm. period so i don't i don't think that that because theory is all the way true um and i think this wants to raise money you know the brand is a it's a double-edged sword you know it, it works well in, the, in terms of getting new users but getting new investors is a lot tougher right because no one wants to be associated with a sin stock like that if they want to go mm -hmm. public, if they want to grow, you know. So honestly, what it sounds like is is ego. We want to make more money. We want to um, get more investors. We want to actually grow to, you know, sell as a company when they're probably growing like crazy organically through their current thesis, you mm -hmm. know. So yeah, man, it, it's it's sad. A lot of people are gonna lose jobs. A lot of girls are gonna lose jobs. Um, but there's gonna be another. Uh, competitive fans for sure that's gonna Another pop only up fans. listen this is the oldest it's the oldest you know industry in the world there's always gonna be guys who want to pay for women yeah and just to see i think what the allure of only fans is it's the girl who's not as public as with, with their nudity but you're curious to see what do they have to provide in that arena you can take like a normal girl that you possibly went to high school and she has an OnlyFans. And if you like that girl in high school, you're thinking, hmm, she has an OnlyFans. I'd pay to see what it is that perhaps I did not have access to. And I think that's the allure of it is a lot of common people who are not working in the sex industry are now having sex accounts where they showcase this nudity. So the mystique is what it is. It's because... Regular porn stars, you easily have access to them. There's like free porn sites you can go watch it, and they're common. But for the regular average girl who has this, there is that mystique of like, hmm, this girl is not really out there like that. But that, you know, <laughs> that allure of her is what draws people in because these are just regular girls like putting out sexual content, and you might not, you might know these people, and that's what excites you to go check it out. So. There'll definitely be another platform like that. We'll see what happens, but uh, I just think OnlyFans is making a 
a bad decision by switching up on people like this. Yeah. I, I was listening to a few podcasts on it. You know, um, I think Lena the Plug was on Philip DeFranco's show. And she mentioned that, like, what was their competitive advantage is that they were, like, Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. Also, I think, who was it? Was Adam22 that mentioned it? But uh, a few people mentioned that it was like Instagram in terms of the UI, UX. So that's why mm-hmm. they had a competitive advantage as well. So it wasn't just, like, the pla- the the value getting, but the actual use case of it, you know, um, that made it more easy to use and, you know, friendly. So that's what, that's why they're really, like, you know, thing on it. But I think that that could probably, like, th- if I was OnlyFans, man, what I would have done is maybe try and, like, white label their, their brand to go something else. You know what I'm saying? I think that would have been the play. Mm-hmm. I would have kept OnlyFans and then made, you know, Patreon competitor to go with that. And then have a whole other arm. That could exactly, have been the move, man. bro. Why wait? Why, why take all your users out? Just keep them happy. Create another, like, duplicate the platform. And just say, hey, for those people who are interested in making an OnlyFans account for non-sex, whatever, yeah. we have this other one you yeah. can try out. So you're not you're not alienating the people who are already there. You're still double dipping with the brand that you've built and the access you have of people. Hey, even use the same people who want to put nudity. They can create another uh, side of their 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 content, which is like straight up. Hey, this is me singing. Exactly. You can access me on this other one. Word. Like, easy. Word. Easy. Like you still make people happy. You just charge them a higher subscription for doing that. Facts. Yeah, that should have been the play. That should be the because they already had the UI UX. Literally, just like hire teams to duplicate that whole process. Bruh. That's what I feel like they should have done personally. They should pay us for consulting. Bruh, right? I lie. <laughs> <laughs> we just save them like so much millions of dollars of re- investing in building a non OnlyFans exactly brand. exactly instead of trying to rebrand them, they could have had investors go with it. You know, because like when you have multiple brands, it kind of, de- it kind of deflates the, the bad sin stock. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, we have only fans, but we also have this amazing platform. That's this Patreon competitor. I don't know, bro. That's just me. That's just us, you know, um, armchair, armchair CEOing, you know, but exactly. Yeah, man. Podcast CEOs. Exactly. Podcast CEOs, man. Um, what else is new with you, bro? What's up? What else is on your mind? Uh, you know, what other things that's been on my mind is we're talking about uh, what I brought up to you earlier is stagnation and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. You feel me? And uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on this because as entrepreneurs, we're, we're always building, we're always creating, but there's moments where you feel as if you're not really taking the next step in your growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to hear your thoughts on this as someone who is building an agency on the side You've been at this business for a couple of years now, mm-hmm. and I wanted just to, you know, have an open conversation, have an open dialogue with you and understanding, you know, when you feel those moments of stagnation, what do you think causes them and how does an entrepreneur break out of that stagnation while not really deviating from what their core competency is with their business? Man, that's such a big question. Um, <sighs> firstly, I think, you need to watch what like what you're taking in, you know, in terms of information. Mm-hmm. Who, who are you listening to? Um, because that like facilitates your growth, you know. Because the mindset of the person driving the train is gonna like control where the train goes. That's been one of the biggest mm-hmm. things. And from surrounding myself with other entrepreneurs, I found that like they just been focused on on growth, on you know. Um, networking, par- participating in different factors to help them, you know, um, get to the next stage of their entrepreneurship journey. And that's really what's been helping me, as well as like positive affirmations um, and really like speaking to um, the next thing. So, and of course, is looking at the numbers, looking at the data, because without that, we just be other people with opinions. So I've been looking at what's been working, and I've been like looking at my like client acquisition strategy and seeing, all right, I got two clients off of this i got one client off of this all right so let's double down off on those strategies and go harder on that you know and that's what what's been helping me grow you know now i have like more leads in my pipeline because of that you know and i'm looking to other get on other platforms like i'm about to start going hard on TikTok now that's my next move you know um mm-hmm. and yeah that's what's really been helping me um, when it comes to being stagnant is looking at the data 
looking at the people that will contribute to my mindset and um, doubling down on what's working. So, yeah, man. But at the, at the same time, bro, like, I get, like, a ton of doubt sometimes. You know, I get, uh, like, the feeling of, man, like, am I, am I in over my head? Mm-hmm. Like, am, am I am I going to fail at this? You know, be just got to, like, just keep talking to yourself positively, you know? Um <sighs> Because it happens, bro. Oh, like, like, like when you hire people, when you, um, you know, uh, yeah, and they don't fulfill on their duty sometimes, or when you um, have like a tough feedback from a client, you know, you really have to like take that on the chin and, you know, just get up the next day and go back to it. You know, um, you realize that you have to be a glutton for pain. I think is one of the biggest things is being able to be all right. That was a problem. Let's try and solve it. Um, and that, that hurt, but I got to get up and tomorrow's the next new day. Let's get back on the grind, you know? So, yeah, you know, it's when you get those blows, it's, it's, it's a mental blow to yourself when you're thinking about, you know, what is it that's gonna take us to the next level? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll share with, I'll share something with you, uh, personally that happened to me like this earlier this week. I think we had a conversation about the podcast and, you know, what we can do to like really grow our community, grow the, the brand and, and stand out as a, as a company. And I remember we were having this conversation, like we, you know, we're searching for answers. We're searching, okay, what do we do as a YouTube as a whatever. And as we're putting out more content and we're like, okay, man, like it, are people not rocking with us anymore. Is it whatever? And I remember going for a walk, I was going beside the water and I remember just sitting down. And honestly, bro, I was so in my, I I felt so like down for a second because it was that feeling of stagnation, which I'm talking about. And bro, honestly, I felt so, it was a moment I felt defeated because we were searching for answers and I couldn't even really grasp what is that going to be? Because there's so much things when you're building a a media content creation, uh, there's no blueprint to whatever we're doing. Mm -hmm. There's no blueprint to showcase how did so-and-so blow up? How did so-and-so get to the next level? How do they get so many views? Um, even when you get to that many views, like, okay, we need to go get cameras. We need to go get invest in this equipment. Okay. We need to find a way to bring money to get these because you're building a media company. So you need money. Okay. Where are we going to get all this money to build, to get this equipment? And bro, I was looking at the water I was sitting there, man, and just like a tear fell down my eye, bro. Really? Like, wallah, bro. For real, man. I felt so, I was just like, man, you know, and I just had a reflection of how long, you know, being on the path of being an entrepreneur and how difficult it is. And as much as positive, as much faith as I have in what we're doing, and I know we're going to get to where we're going to f- get to eventually one day, it was just a feeling of, Sometimes you just need to let loose, man. You need to, you know, you just go <sighs> and just feel all that pain come out of you, yeah. bro. You get sure. me. And I was, I remember just like, I was at the farthest end because I just wanted alone time. And I remember this couple walked by with their dog and they looked at me because I was sitting there. I don't know if you've seen that Popeye's meme of that old la- of that lady just sitting down, looking down at the ground she's she's like a cook she's a fry cook and i think it was taken from the whole chicken sandwich saga that happened back in the day remember ah, i don't remember this it, it search search it up popeye's bean. But, right. yeah popeye's popeye's lady sitting in the back looking down right. are you looking I'm it looking up? up right now but as you're looking yeah, that up going. guys yeah it was such a difficult moment. I was just thinking about the journey oh, personally yeah, for me. me. She's just like, you've seen oh, that. Man, she just sitting down. Oh, you can tell that day's been long. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's been long, just, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, so I was just sitting there on the benches, just looking down. I was like, damn, man. You know? Mm-hmm. what? What? How are we going to get to that next level? Okay, we need to get money. Okay, how are we going to get this money to buy this? Okay, when we buy this, okay, we need someone to help us produce this. Okay, how are we going to get that? You know, so it's every solution you think you see the obstacle that you need to get over to get that. And then once you get that, okay, we need to get there. Then that's another obstacle you got to get to. So 
it's like this uh, maze you're going through. Once you open a door, you're met with another wall. Then you got to go around that wall. Then when you get over the wall, you got to open that door. And then you got to find the keys to that door. And you got to find the keys that fit to open that door. And then when you open that door, it's like, okay, when are we going to get to the banquet hall? Like where we can actually, okay, we made it here, right? Where is that? Where? How do we get to the banquet hall, bro? And that's a question I was asking myself when I was feeling. So I'm just like, man, I was just, I was just like, you know what? Screw this, man. Let me just stop thinking about it. And I just played like my jazz music, chilled there for a second, drank some water, you know, wiped my tears away and just went back to the crib. Mm. So just wanted to tell you that that's what happened to me that day, man. Like when we're thinking about ideas right. and how to get on top. Bro, I hear you, man. Sometimes it'd be so frustrating. You'd be there just like, bro, what's going on? You know, but I realized that like some days you just gotta fake it, bro. That's that's what I've been realizing, man. Because there's some days where it's like it's just not looking bright, and you just gotta put on the the face of it's gonna be it's gonna be okay. And I think the challenge is when that runs out. That's I think what the challenge is. <laughs> when you start, when, bro. That's when, that, you know you're talking yeah, about faking, you're faking it. it for I, a while, I was faking and then it. It's like all right, my guy. I've been faking this for a while now. <laughs> Now I'm like, all right. You can't fake the funk exactly. forever. And now you're like, all right. I've been faking this funk for like a good, like, a good little while. Now I'm starting to feel the realness of it, you know? So I was like, all right, this is really starting to hit. Let, let, let's, let's get on top of shit for sure, bro. Um, and what that is, is this is where you got to try different shit. That's really what it is, man. We just got to try different shit um, and, and get out of our comfort zones. You know, I, that's what I think it is, really. And that's what I think we gotta get out, get like for the podcast specifically. That's what I think we gotta get in person, man. Like in person, that's gonna be the, that's the, next, that's the move. next move for sure. Like I don't know how much it's gonna cost, but like we just gotta set that set that up, get them cameras up, and just start rocking cameras in person, man. invest in cameras, in, in mics, mm -hmm. a producer to help like record the whole joint properly without us. You know, it's one thing to record. But then there's one thing to record when you're thinking about, okay, is the camera going to stop on us? Okay, is that camera working? Having that flow of com conversation, especially when you have a guest, it, you know, you need to have that stress not on you because you need to make sure the cameras are working, the mics are working. And that's why having another body is so key to making sure everything is, is, is going. Like, you know, we need, a, we need a Jamie on board. So if we have any Jamies out there who are listening... You know, you, you're a fan of the show and you want to contribute and you want to be part of something big, you know, a multi-billion dollar media brand hustle over everything, then join us. Hit us up at 24-7 Hustler, uh, Elevated Alexander, or Owen Osinde. And let me know, guys. C come you join know? Death Row. And also, share. come, come join. <laughs> exactly. And also let us know, you know, when you feel stagnant in your process, in your business, how do you get over that emotional, um, like, uh, block to move over to really still keep going? Cause we're, we're all winners, but you know, sometimes we have to, we have roadblocks, but we don't have answers. So how do you guys manage and how do you cope with that? We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, honestly, yeah, if you DM us, I think that'd be a great conversation to, to have, you know, um, getting over those humps of anxiety, depression, languishing. You know, one podcast I was listening to was Diary of a CEO. Um, shout out to Steven. Um, I'm talking like I know him. Um, I can't remember his last name, though. His first name is Steven. Y'all look up that podcast. It's really good. And even some of the, the top entrepreneurs who build multi-million dollar companies, that they get into this hamster wheel of this languishing and consistency, you know, where they're just, you know, on this hamster wheel of continuing and continuing and continuing and they're building something up but they're losing themselves in the process because they're wrapping themselves up in the business they're wrapping um their families up in the business you know and it's like a baby you know um like one thing mm -hmm. I, I noticed is that when a lot of these entrepreneurs sell their company they actually go through through grief you know they go through the seven stages of grief from mm -hmm. losing what they consider like a big part of themselves and they have to rediscover who they are. You know, it's like an athlete retiring almost sometimes, you know? So it really mm -hmm. puts into perspective, like how much you're giving to this, to this entity. Right. And, and what you got to be aware of when you're giving so much to this entity, because when you're so like 
committed, it takes a lot from you. That's going to take from your family, from your friends, from your health. You know, you got to be aware of that and, and take steps to counteract that, whether it be taking time to, um, you know, recuperate with what, whatever your your positive vice is. Like sometimes people might have playing video games, um, playing um, a specific sport, going for walks. Like think about what are some of the things you do. For me, like I, I got the, like, wrapped up in my business the, like for the last few weeks and I haven't been going for my walks as a recent on my bike rides and that's what I've been having an effect on me. Yo, but I've went to the gym though. Those walks, walks are, are key. key. Walks are key. And that's why I'm, I'm happy I live yeah. by the lake. And like, honestly, I feel like I might be like the move for life personally is like to live by a body of water. Mm-hmm. You know, like as humans, I feel like we need to live that. I used to be like, oh, y'all live by bodies of water because of the U.S. Now I'm like, as humans, it's probably better, you know. Um, and yeah, bro. man, I could not agree with you more, Al, man. Like, I swear there's something about water that puts your state of mind in a tranquil place it's you can't explain it but just the smell of it when you stare at it it just puts you in a place Mm -hmm. of peace and you're actually allowed to just unleash yourself man it's like it's different it's different man and i I can't agree with you more and i'm happy to hear you're you're back to working now man that the gyms are open you know back to our fitness sure bro i am 260 pounds bro I'm a big boy, bro. So I'm, I'm 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 in the gym um, religiously. Um, I wake up at like 5:30 a.m. and I'm in the gym um, for a good 45. And then uh, I start my day. So I set my normal flow now. You be up in the gym just working on my fitness. He's my witness. And I don't know that one. Which one is that? For delicious. I don't know it. Yeah, yeah, for delicious. I know it, but I'm not going to remember. Man, Fergalicious? Yo, that's a classic, classic Fergalicious. Man. Oh, is that is that Fergalicious? Yo, Fergalicious oh. was as a, is, is a indigent, oh, Fergie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, Fergie, I mean, Fergalicious uh, is a scam. Gym just working on my fitness. Cause she ain't got scam, no bro. ass. She should be like, on the, all my humps, my lovely lady loves. She she be showing nobody. Bro, I used to think she was so thick, like, but scam, she's not. Scam. <laughs> Pump scam. faking everybody. Word. Her and J Lo. Those are the two <laughs> biggest scams of entertainment that J Lo and Fergalicious what? had. Who said J Lo? That an was ass. the biggest thing that J Lo had the, the most rump r- r- rumpacious, you know, but protruding. The way they were talking about J Lo. <laughs> scam. <laughs> scam about that day, huh? You know, I used to like, I'm like, dog, I'm like, it's, I, I might, maybe I'm not yeah. seeing what I'm seeing, but I don't see it. I don't see it. You know what? Like, a scout tells you, like, yo, this is the hottest basketball prospect coming out. And you just go and they just don't pass the eye test. Nice. You know the eye test? It's like you haven't even seen it. But, like, yo, I, I just – you don't pass – before I even watch you play, you just don't pass the eye test. Like, you know? So that's what I used to say. I'm like, where is this J-Lo hype coming from? And I bought into it. And I used to, like, mentally think, oh, yo, J-Lo is packing like that. I'm like, no, she's not. She's not at all. No, never was. Freaking you know, people, they tried to bro. convince us that J Lo had Bati, Frankie had Bati. Yo, man, they tried to brand Pink as like a like the the, the angst white girl that was like all with all the black people. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Industries, man. They tried. Man, they tried. They tried. They, they tried. won. No, they they, they tried this, to succeed. This succeeded. is how you manufacture. They tried to it. Let's keep it a fact. Cause they did. But I think I think people need t- need to wake up. Yeah, we woke up definitely. Wake, we woke up. We woke up and smelt the coffee. Facts, that's for facts, sure. Facts, facts, facts. Another news though: who people who woke up and smelt the coffee today was uh, TDE. You know, because because Kendrick TDE. is gone from the, off this next album. You know, which is interesting. Man, like Kendrick Lamar. Which is interesting. Top dog entertainment is losing their yeah. like, you know, their 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 main cash cow. This is, it's interesting. Bro. Yeah. I wonder if they're gonna. No, yeah. like you know, what? what's up? No, no, no. I was just, I was just gonna talk some crap, like say your bitch, <laughs> your bitch. But, but uh, <laughs> I think this could be good for J Rock and and you know Schoolboy Schoolboy Q and App Soul because now that Kendrick's off, they'll have more room to to blossom. You know what I'm saying? More attention can mm-hmm. be on them. SZA's getting a ton of attention. 
Um, but I've sold is is not really getting that much. So this is the music pod, but just to like talk about stuff that's been on my mind. So, man, you know, like the TDE yeah. roster, they're all kind of the same, right? They all have like this this kind of um, no, no, hear me what? out. Their vibe, their vibe, like like certain artists, like if you go to um, Young Money, they all have like a Young Moneyness to them. What? Like, yeah, yeah. Bruh, like Young Money, Lil Wayne, Tiger is Drake. the same as Drake. <laughs> but I just think like when you when you look at like SZA, Absol, Zakari, all these guys within TDE, I feel like every label, their artists kind of have like they, they, okay, maybe it's just the way I perceive things, but. When I see a group of people, I kind of see like they kind of take on like the same energy. And I feel like Lil Wayne, Nicki Minaj, Drake, they all have like their own. Maybe it's just like from them associating with each other. Like I mentally put them in a block of you guys belong together. And whenever I see them, I kind of associate Absol with like the Kendrick type of sound or whatever, or the Zakari or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm coming now? Do you, is that saying. making sense? It's like. There's a mental association with the man doing what they're doing and their music kind of starts sounding alike in the way they make beats, in the way their sound sound, and et cetera. That's what I meant by I kind of see them all alike in a way. They're like more branches of the same tree. I mean of the I mean, same nucleus. They have like they have this the T D E nucleus in it. I mean, in regards to young money, I guess they're all off a uh, fruit off Wayne Street. But I definitely think that they they have their own their own sound, their own style, their own way of communicating. You know, like Absol doesn't sound anything like Schoolboy Q. Um, they might be on the same type of beat sometimes, but no, not. I don't even know if I would say that. You know, like Schoolboy Q has his own defined style. You know, uh, Kendrick has his mm-hmm. own defined style. Absol has his own defined style. Like their own branding, their own their own individual lanes, you know. So I couldn't say maybe like at the end of the day, like to the end consumer, it's like you know buying. I don't know if I, what I could compare it to, like I don't know, like like flashlights. You know what I'm saying? Like the end of the end of the day, you want something that shines bright. You know, but like they could just told there's different levels of flashlights in the lane, but at the same time, there's gonna be the main consumers that use a flashlight to get that job done after listening to music. But, but yeah, nah, bro, I, I see, I, I see them in totally different lanes, but now they have the, the light on them to really like go far. I think Ab Soul is like the main person that needs like that hit because J Rock's had hits, Scuba Q's had tons of hits. But App Soul still hasn't had mm-hmm. that like that one hit, um, that commercial, commercial hit. You know, I think everybody besides App Soul has had his success. I don't know. I don't think Zakari has had his success either. But he's new, you know. Mm-hmm. So so yeah, I think App Soul is due is well overdue. His 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 time in the light for sure, you know. But let's work towards wrapping up, man. Um, uh, the last things on my mind. Speaking of like the mu- the music industry is the royalties mm-hmm. in podcasting man let's talk about this yo because th- let's discuss so what's happening within All this right, world so take this in so if if a song streams on apple right that artist gets paid mm-hmm. royalties on that song for a three minute two minute one mm-hmm. minute song right if someone's yeah. on apple music playing and on that platform they get paid for that. If my podcast mm-hmm. plays on Apple Music or Apple Podcast for an hour, we make no money. An hour, an hour stream. stream versus a one minute stream. We're keeping people in, engaged for an hour on and a platform. We, get, we make no money off that. How does that make any sense? On Spotify, if I keep you engaged for an hour, there's no royalties given to the artist who has per- that person on that platform for over an hour. How does that make any sense? Like, even if it's like a fraction of a cent, like it is with streaming, there should be some kind of royalties given out, you know? 
Mm-hmm. How does that make any sense? And that kind of explains Spotify's new move of investing heavily in podcasts because they ain't got to pay nobody. They can just come and, and pillage the, like Joe Budden's word, pillage the 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 content creators. What does that even pillage mean? Pillage means like, it's like, it's like rob. Like, let's, let's look that up to have a specific definition. Pillage, Jim, can you look that up for us, please? Jamie, pull so it up. Pillage is like excessive of, of robbing. It's like to rob a place using violence, especially in wartime. Um, the action of pillaging a place of property, especially in wartime. Yeah, it's like, you know, um, we're destroying your whole, like, you're taking everything. It's a hostile exactly, takeover. Exactly. Um, so that's what it seems like the the new industry is doing with podcasts. That's why it's getting so popular because it's a win for people who want the clout and um, people mm-hmm. who want to take advantage of them and get them streams up and get people on the platform for a longer period of time. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that from what I'm hearing is you're saying that these companies, the Spotify's, the Apple's are using podcasting as more of like a top of the funnel way to get people on their platform and then subscribe so they can listen to the music and everything while not compensating the content creators for bringing people exactly. to their platform. Exactly. So with Spotify, what they're doing too is that it's a, it's a, um, it's a, property game for Spotify. That's where they're buying up podcasts. That's why mm-hmm. Joe Budden didn't join Spotify because they wanted to buy him out and everything under his network that he was going to drop. And own exactly. his content. So they have the content play in that sense. Right? But um, with podcasts now, the fact that there's no royalties that, that that's given out is is the play um, as well. So that's what I think is, is messed up. Like there isn't, there's no form of compensation for keeping people on the platform for an hour. That's ridiculous. Mm. What solutions do you think they this should, should be implement? Podcast royalties. Get... It's that simple. It's that hey, if you have a podcast, mm-hmm. you should sign up for this royalty program and get royalties that way. You know that. Yeah, yeah. like YouTube. But you disagree though. Like, like, what's your opinion, bro? Because, well, I think when we had this conversation earlier on, I didn't really see the whole problem with it because. I was looking at it from a position where music and podcasting are totally different, where music as an industry is already established. You have record labels, you have people who have masters, um, they have copyrights on their music and et cetera. And Apple is essentially allowing people to listen to these tracks while paying these artists and paying their record labels the money. Podcasting was, there's no podcast Sony music entertainment or Sony podcast entertainment, where you can say I've signed towards a record company as a podcaster. So I was under that mentality and I was looking at it from them, but then I stepped back out and I saw, okay, as independent creators, as independent musicians, not every musician is going to be on Sony or any other major record label, but if we're coming on and we're bringing people to your platform as creators, we should get compensated for it. So in the beginning, I was disagreeing with you, but when you broke it down, I definitely do agree that if there is like a YouTube royalty network where you're playing ads on our podcast, if you're not a subscriber to uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, I know it's free, but if you're bringing people on board, still have like a way to compensate people. And it's also a win-win for them to get money off advertising too. I just think podcasting is like, they need to make podcasting as it's getting harder, people need to pay to listen to podcasts, especially Apple Podcasts. It's the biggest, they own podcasting, right? They have the biggest podcast platform in the world and it's free. Mm-hmm. So if people can subscribe to that and, you know, we can make money off it, I think that's the next play. That is the next play. That's what they're moving towards. You know what I'm saying? But with that said, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to work towards wrapping up. Um, it's been a great podcast, a great wildcard episode. We didn't even introduce the podcast. How horrible of us. Um, but you know what it is. With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, the hustle is what you can control. So control your grind and control your life. I'm Alex, and that's Hustle Over, Over Everything Podcast, y'all. Peace. Peace.